lesson, be recalled to your mind the great triumph of Christ over our enemies in his death. The scriptures tell us that he spoiled principalities and powers, making a show of them openly in the cross. That in his death he destroyed him that had the power of death, that is the devil. Now the relevancy of this to you is found in your baptism into Christ's death. You have been baptized into his death where this great victory has occurred. And we challenge you to capitalize upon it by believing it, rejoicing in it, and thanking God for the triumph Jesus experienced over your enemies. You are more than a conqueror through him that loved you. Now today we want to concentrate on your baptism into Christ himself, into his person. We want to build assurance in your heart to make you confident before God to make you be able to stroll through this life with a triumphant spirit, realizing that you're a child of the God and have divine resources at your access. Assurance is produced by reasoning upon the divine foundation and upon what's built on that foundation. The foundation is the vicarious death of Christ, the substitutionary death of Christ. He took your place in sin's responsibility before God. What is built upon that death is your faith and obedience. When you believed and were baptized into Christ, what happened was you built upon the foundation that has been laid, which is Christ Jesus. Now the apostles did not hesitate to refer to our baptism, and that's why we're taking time to extend this teaching to you. Your baptism into Christ is a ground, a legitimate ground, for confidence before God. Our text is found in Galatians, the third chapter, and verse 27, a short but a pungent verse. Can you receive it and believe it? For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. As many of you, every one of you, there are no exceptions. If you are baptized sincerely, Prompted by faith, you are baptized into Christ. As many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Being in Christ is a central issue in Scripture. It's associated with great foundational statements. I think of that statement of 2 Corinthians, the fifth chapter, in verse 17, which says, If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Behold, old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Now the scripture tells us we are baptized into Christ. And if you're in Christ, you're a new creature. You may not feel like a new creature. You may assess yourself not to be a new creature. But the word of the king is, as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. And if any man is in Christ, he is a new creature. Baptism is not just a ritual. It's not just a form. It's not just merely immersion. While the immersion of the body in water is an absolute imperative in the kingdom of God and is the only action that can adequately fulfill the command of Jesus Christ, baptism is more than the immersion of the body. Baptism is both inward and outward. Peter describes this at some detail in the first epistle of Peter chapter 3 and verse 21. The like figure whereunto baptism doth now also save us, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Removing that parenthetical statement, let me read that text this way. The like figure run to even baptism doth now also save us by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We were baptized into his death and raised with him. Now it was not just a ritual, not a ceremonial washing, or as Peter puts, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh. It was not a ceremonial washing like they had under the law where they had diverse washings, where they cleansed their bodies ceremonially to make them acceptable to the camp of God's people. Baptism is the answer of a good conscience toward God. Once a person hears the gospel, once they realize their own infection with sin, their devotion to it, 
their conscience becomes defiled. But in baptism, it's an answer of a good conscience toward God. I've obeyed the gospel. I have done what you said, Lord. You have asked me to believe and be baptized. I have done it, and I receive your commitment that I will be saved. It's the answer of a good conscience. That's inward. That is inward, and it's part of your baptism. We want you to capitalize on the inward part and reason from the outward part. Form is important. We do not mean at all to derogate form. When we say that it's essential that the inward part be emphasized, we are not de-emphasizing the outward part. The Word of the Lord tells us that form is, is a vital part of the doctrine. In Romans the 6th chapter and verse 17, referring to baptism, Paul says, You have obeyed from the heart the form of the doctrine which was delivered unto you. The doctrine was the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ. The doctrine included him dying for sin, being buried and raised again for our justification. The doctrine included you being reconciled by his death and justified by his resurrection, being reconciled to God, cleansed from your sin, and washed from it. That's the doctrine. The form of the doctrine, the external display of it, was your baptism. You were buried and you were raised in precise likeness to Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. Water was also required. In Acts the 10th chapter and verse 48, the Apostle Peter, after observing the acceptance of the Gentiles by God, an epochal event some ten years after Pentecost, even the apostles were operating under the idea that the Gentiles were unacceptable. When Peter saw that they had been accepted by God and that the gospel pertains to them, he said, who can forbid water that these should be baptized? So form is important. Water is necessary. And a burial is necessary. We are buried with Christ by baptism into death. Buried with him. So let us not derogate form. Form is vital. <clears throat> form without content amounts to nothing before God. That is to say the form is like a cup. The content is the baptism, like the water in the cup. Now the doctrine without a form is inaccessible to men. You're not able to appropriate it, not able to identify yourself with it. You're thrown into an eternal guessing game as to whether the death of Christ applies to you or not whether your sins have been forgiven or not, whether you've been washed or not. I know very well that there are some that tell you just bow your head and raise your hand and just utter a prayer to God to be merciful to you a sinner. But those of you that are honest know that it takes more than that. God has associated the form with content. The content, the content is the gospel. The form is your baptism and it contains for you an association with the death of Jesus Christ. Content without form is no good. It makes the gospel ethereal and beyond your grasp. The answer of a good conscience toward God. That's why you felt so good when you were baptized. That's why you were happy in Christ Jesus when you were baptized. That's why the Ethiopian eunuch of Acts chapter 8 went on his way rejoicing when he was baptized. He had the answer of a good or a purged or cleansed conscience to God. The blood of Christ purges our conscience from dead works to serve the living God. That occurred when you were baptized. You see, the emphasis in baptism is not the baptism itself. Baptism is not an end of itself. It's what is accomplished in your baptism. That is the point of Scripture. Note very carefully how often this association is made. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. That's the accomplishment. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. That's the accomplishment. Acts 2 and verse 38. Why tarriest thou arise and be baptized? Washing away thy sins, calling upon the name of the Lord. That's the accomplishment. Romans the 6th chapter and verse 3, Know ye not that so many of us who are baptized into his death? Into his death. That's the accomplishment. We became identified with his death and the benefits that accrued from it. 
We were buried with Christ, Romans 6, 4. That's the accomplishment. And our text in Galatians 3, 27, as many of you as were baptized into Christ. That's the accomplishment. Now, were these things not accomplished, baptism would have no meaning whatsoever. The accomplishment of our washing, of the remission of sins, of our death to sin, of being buried with Christ, of being in Christ, that's what validates our baptism. That's what gives it meaning. That's why we say baptism is both inward and outward. It's a form and it has content. You were baptized outwardly, but the inward transactions that occurred simultaneous with your baptism is the ground of your confidence and assurance before the living God. Now, the objective does not obviate the means. That is to say, the reason for being baptized does not do away with being baptized. That's why Jesus commanded that the gospel be preached and men and women be baptized into him. Both of these must go together the form and the content, the outward and the inward. Baptized into Christ. What does that mean? Let's look into this. This is a critical matter. If you're in Christ, what does it mean to be in Him? Is it just a formality, just some words that are given in the Scripture? If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Let's expound this for a moment. To be in Christ means that you are, in words of Scripture, a partaker of the divine nature. Now that text is found in 2 Peter, the first chapter in verse 4, which proclaims we are partakers, we have been made partakers of the divine nature. That's a staggering thought, isn't it? The divine nature. That's God's nature. We have been made a partaker of God's nature. His character, his affection. Going a little further in Hebrews, the third chapter, in verse 14, we are proclaimed as partakers of Christ. Christ himself becomes a part of us. This is what it means to be in Christ, to partake of him, his character, his benefits, his insights. It means we see things like Christ sees them, when we walk by faith. It means we are repelled by the things Christ is repelled by. It means we rejoice in the things in which Christ rejoices. We have his outlook. We have his perspective as he walked by faith, our partaker of Christ. Let's take it a little further. In Romans, the eighth chapter and verse 17, it proclaims that we are joint heirs with Christ. Heirs of God, joint heirs with Christ. The things that are promised Christ, the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame for the joy that was set before him, the scriptures say. You become a joint heir of that joy. You will participate in the world to come in the glorious benefits that Christ is enjoying now. The Word of God tells us that we are partakers of all the promises that were made to the seed, which is Christ Jesus. Galatians, the third chapter. Again, a text that we have come across before, but it's such a revolutionary text, I wanted to mention it again. Galatians 3 and verse 16 affirms that the promises were made to Abraham and his seed. To Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith, and to, not unto seeds as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. <clears throat> now notice our text has told us that we're baptized into Christ. This verse that I have just read is in that same chapter, Galatians, the third chapter. Baptized into Christ, who is the seed to whom the promises were made. Now I'm affirming that in Christ Jesus, becoming a partaker of Christ, you become an inheritor of the promises made to Christ. Now, this is confirmed to you in verse 29, just shortly after our text of Galatians 3.27. And if ye be Christ's, and as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ, and you are Christ, if ye be Christ, then are you Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. There are the promise made to Christ, but you participate in it as you're made a partaker 
of Jesus Christ. Now there's another benefit for being in Christ. It's stated in 1 Corinthians, the second chapter, and verse 16, where it says, we have the mind of Christ. This again is one of the mind-boggling statements of Scripture. Now some are of the persuasion that this is speaking only of the apostles, that only the apostles had the mind of Christ. I beg to differ with that view. In verse 15, qualifying this statement, the apostle says, He that is spiritual judgeth all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. The spiritual person is the person that follows the direction of the Holy Spirit of God. That is to say, he's inclined to the truth and he evaluates things and perceives them in view of the truth. The spiritual person is the person who has the mind of Christ. We, after all, have been joined to the Lord. There in 1 Corinthians, the sixth chapter and verse 17, he that is joined to the Lord is one spirit. Now think of this also concerning the spiritual person or the person that has the mind of Christ. To be spiritually minded is life. There's a reciprocity, a response to God, a receptivity to him that comes when you have the mind of Christ. You know, Christ was receptive to his heavenly Father. When his Father spoke, he heard him. Now, God may not speak to you everything that he spoke to Christ. In fact, there's no question that he will not. But what God does speak to you, because you are partaker of Christ, you'll be able to hear with your heart to perceive and understand and to launch out into a life of well-pleasing to our heavenly Father. To be in Christ means that you are accepted by God. Ephesians, the first chapter and verse 6, tells us that he has made us accepted in the beloved. Now, God is not reluctant to receive you in Christ. You've been baptized into Christ, and you are as accepted with God as Christ is. That is to say, God would have to repudiate Christ to repudiate those that are in Christ. Christ and his people stand together. Now I ask you, isn't that a wonderful truth? Something to rejoice in? He's made us accepted in the beloved. There's a statement made in Hebrews, the second chapter in verse 11, that opens this up even more. It conveys to us Christ's attitude about those that are in him. For both he that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified are all of one, for which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren. He that sanctifieth, that's Christ. Christ sanctified us by his death. They that are sanctified, that's we that are in Christ Jesus. We're all of one, that's God the Father. God is Christ's Father, God is your Father. Jesus Christ was begotten of God, you were begotten of God by his word, according to James 1.18. Now, because of this commonality between us and Christ and God, Jesus is not ashamed to call us his brethren. What a thought that is. And may I say, I'm not ashamed to call you, baptized believer. I'm not ashamed to call you brother if Jesus is not ashamed to call you brother. And God is not ashamed to call you his son and to receive you because you've obeyed from the gospel. You've obeyed from the heart the form of the truth given to you and as a result have been placed into Christ. Again, a text which we have come across several times in these lessons, Hebrews the 10th chapter and verse 19, which urges you as a child of God to come near to God, not to draw back from him. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and a living way, which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Think of all those reasons. The blood of Christ has cleansed us from sin. 
having this knowledge that the blood of Christ has cleansed us in a new and a living way. Jesus has opened up the way to God. He's taken out of the way things that stood between you and God. He's blotted out the handwriting of ordinances between you and God. He's destroyed the devil that tries to keep you from God. He's taken your sin out of the way, spoiled principalities and powers. The way is open. He has opened the door of heaven. Malachi, in the third chapter of his book, talked about the windows of heaven being opened. The door of heaven has been flung open to you. Come, come to him. Without hesitancy, come. You are in Christ and are as accepted as Jesus himself. I trust that you can see the essentiality of knowing these things. You'll never be able to come to God unless you recognize that God has accepted you in Christ Jesus, that you are an integral part of Christ. You are of his body. You're a member of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. You personally are recognized in heaven. Heaven knows you by name. God knows you by name. The angels have been dispatched to minister unto you, according to Hebrews, the first chapter. Now, this is a reciprocal dwelling, this being in Christ. By that I mean you are in Christ and Christ is in you. The union is so close that it's almost inconceivable and undiscernible that it has occurred. The Word of God says this in Colossians 1.27, Christ in you, the hope of glory. Again, the reciprocal view, 2 Corinthians 5.17, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. The union, therefore, that has been accomplished in your baptism between you and Christ is so close that Christ is said to be in you and you are said to be in Christ. You will recall that all spiritual blessings are in Christ Jesus. Ephesians, the first chapter and verse 3. He hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Now you have been baptized into Christ Jesus, which means you have personal access to all the spiritual benefits that God has for his people. Everything that fortifies the soul and anchors to heaven is in Christ Jesus. Now let's have some closing remarks about the accomplishments of your baptism, of being in Christ Jesus. In Christ Jesus, you are established, believer. He which establisheth you in Christ is God, according to 2 Corinthians, the first chapter and verse 21. Established fortified, made solid in Christ Jesus. What does that mean? Ephesians, the fourth chapter and verse 14 states it from the negative point of view, that you'll be no more children tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine. No more children made stable, solid, fortified, established in Christ Jesus. The cyclical religion that so many people have is not necessary. Up and down, in and out, down and out, cold and hot, it's not necessary. You do not have to live that sort of a life. Seasonal religion is not compatible with the faith. You have been baptized into Christ and are established by God in Him. God establishes you to the degree that you are aware of your fellowship with Christ Jesus. If you live in ignorement of your life in Christ, your establishment will not be facilitated. God works through your faith, through your consciousness, through your awareness, through your spiritual alertness. So I challenge you to consider seriously these things about being baptized into Christ and being established by Him. You realize in Christ Jesus a consistent triumph. He causeth us, 2 Corinthians 2 and verse 14 states, He causeth us always to triumph in Christ Jesus. Defeat is only out of Christ. Only victory is in Christ. Now let me interpret that for you for a moment. 
Victory is not always riding on the crest of the wave. Victory in this case, triumph in this case, means that Satan does not realize his objectives with you. Satan's objective is to get you to stop believing. But if you keep the faith, if you keep believing, and fight the good fight of faith, you've won, believer. You've triumphed over Satan. To put it the other way, if you keep the faith, the faith will keep you. Now let's review very briefly what we've covered in this lesson. We've been baptized into Christ. Baptism is both outward and inward. Outwardly, the emphasis is on obedience, your immersion in the water. But that outward was a form that was invested with content. The content is the inward purging of the conscience, the answer of a good conscience toward God. This act puts you into Christ Jesus, where there is remission of sin, where there is washing and cleansing, where there is victory over Satan, where Satan is destroyed and principalities and powers overthrown. You personally, as a result of being in Christ, are recognized in heaven. Jesus is not ashamed to call you his brother. God is not ashamed to call you his son. The angels are not ashamed to protect you and to minister to you. And the Holy Spirit is not ashamed to deal gently with you and to woo you and open up to you the wonderful truths of God. It's a glorious gospel that tells us Satan can lose. All too much credit is given to Satan in our day. The word of the Lord tells us he walks about as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. But resist him steadfast in the faith. If you keep believing, there's not a chance Satan can win. He is not invincible when you believe. You are more than a conqueror through Christ Jesus that loved you. Now my exhortation to you is to keep the faith and to be of good cheer. You were placed into Christ at your baptism. All of the things that are His are yours when you're in Him. The Holy Spirit has identified your induction into Christ with the day and the hour you were baptized. Now, capitalize upon it.